Well, um, welcome back, everybody, and welcome to Discovering uh, the Intangible Spirit of Place Through Musical Performance in Historic Spaces with our wonderful panel. I'd like to begin the session by acknowledging um, that we're meeting here on Gadigal Country, and I'd like to pay my respect to Elders of the Eora Nation, um, past and present, and extend that respect to First Nations people here today. Um, let me introduce our brilliant panel. Um, we have uh, Graeme Skinner, who is um, an independent scholar and musicologist. He's the curator of Austral Harmony, which is a, a magical uh, repository of Australian music history and a postdoctorate fellow on hearing the music of um, early New South Wales. Actually, our whole panel belongs to the ARC research group, hearing the um, music of early New South Wales. Um, Professor Jacqueline Troy is the Director of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Research at the University of Sydney. Uh, Neil Perez de Costa is the Associate Dean of Research and Performance of Historical Performance, sorry, at the University of Sydney, Sydney Conservatorium, and he is a world uh, recognised performing scholar on historical keyboards. And we also have uh, Matthew Stevens, who is the Research Librarian at the Caroline Simpson Library and Research Collection at the Sydney Living Museums. Um, let me hand over to you. Thanks very much. <laughs> Um, yes, I come from Sydney Living Museums, which used to be Historic Houses Trust, and it's just been renamed um, Museums of History in New South Wales. Today I'll just talk about Sydney Living Museums, just to keep things simple. Um, but the Historic Houses Trust gives a bit of a clue as to why I'm here in the first place. Um, so I think everybody here has been involved in this sense of intangible spirit and place. Um, and I think everybody here pretty well too, from what I'm hearing um, today and yesterday, and what we, what's coming tomorrow. Um, so we've been, we've been working over many projects uh, looking at, um, as you'll see from the abstract, at, at historic houses for a start, that's my particular area of interest, um, and wondering how can we change our understanding of these places by the types of music that we choose, or does it change anything? Uh, does the place change our understanding of the music itself? Um, uh, does it create something that's unique or not? Um, how do musicians respond to this process of pl putting particular types of music? Um, and I should say, in, in our case, it, it's, it's historic performance, so it's historic pieces of music that have actually come from our properties generally, to start with. That was the principle that we, we'd come from because we manage historic houses. Um, and then how, how does this impact our understanding of the canon, does it? Um, and then just the, the spirit of place as well, and Jackie's going to talk later about that work that that we're doing right now. I mean, this is, this is over 10 years, in fact. So it's a 10-year project. We've had it's about six or seven projects and um, 16 concerts that we've done. So it's quite a, 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 a big project now. It's, it's taken a long time to evolve, and it's very much a process of evolving. Um, and so, um, so, so today we're going to talk about um, what this might mean um, through these projects. Um, but this whole ARC project in itself um, is reflecting a lot of these things. So we might go to the next slide. Just, um, um, does someone want to talk about the actual ARC? Well, I think you should. Mm -hmm. We just we uh, we just decided to um, separate <coughs> our. to separate our work into three separate mm -hmm. strands. Um, settler colonial art music, which basically means concert music, house music, theatre music, anything that's composed in a traditional sort of word, uh, sort of uh, notes and words on paper sort of way. Then popular music, there's a quite a lot of crossover in the, in the colonial era with, um, with art music. But there is also a lot of music which they used to call in those days national music. It's what we would call these days folk music, or part of what we would call these days folk music. In other words, traditional songs or songs that are not written down or never were written down as musical text. They might have, have a tune that's borrowed from something else with a new set of words and it takes on a life of its own. Um, a very good example in Australian tradition is um, the later song, Click Go the Shears, for instance, which is based on a tune written by an American composer in the Civil War time um, called Ring the Bell Watchman. Um, but it's become an Australian folk tune through use. So that's, 
the second layer. And then the third layer, we were very interested in um, a series of musical transcriptions of indigenous songs from all over Australia, but we, most particularly for our project in New South Wales. There aren't many of them, but these are, were um, melodic transcriptions of indigenous songs written down in the first, part, first half of the 19th century. And we're interested in looking at those as the basis for creative re-performances these day, today by indigenous people. And this is what Jackie will be talking about especially. So, um, as I said, the impetus for the organisation that I work for is from the houses. So the houses are collections. They're full of staff. Um, it's not from the music perspective to start with. Um, that's a particular interest of mine, but not of the institution as such. And so we, as I say, this has been going for 10 years, and um, it really started with um, the acquisition of a building, Throsby Park in Mossvale, which had a library and some music in it. And we acquired this music, um, started looking at the music, I thought, this is really interesting, we need to know more about it. Uh, and so we actually employed Graham in 2011 to, to give us an assessment of Throsby Park's music. We thought, okay, we better check in the other houses as well. So we have a fantastic collection, collection at Rouse Hill Estate, which is um, a house built around 1820. Five generations have lived there, they haven't chucked a thing away. So it's this incredibly layered, very fragile, very complicated um, interior and stuff. And uh, so about 1,500 pieces, I think, are in that house, which is pretty wonderful. Um, and then we have Maruga, which is down at Nara, which is a very Scottish house, a women's house. A lot of women lived in that house. And again, full of national Scottish music, um, sort of typical Scottish music from the late 19th century. But there are sort of intriguing notes in diaries about some of the young women going and singing to their Scottish relatives. And she'd say, I sang 50 Scottish songs. Um, and you can tell us something different to the national things that they've got in the house. We can't capture that. We don't know what they were doing, but you can tell it's not the same thing. Um, she'd never been to Scotland, by the way. She's just learnt this from family. Um, so we had these houses. We, we asked Graham to actually do a, a report on all of this music. And he came back with this fantastic description of what we had in each property, but also just the, the broader context of what did this music mean. And it's primarily 19th century. It's a little bit in the 20th century, but not much. Um, this was an amazing tool for me then to take it to the institution and say, look at the story. We have to use music to tell our story. And look, it's not, an old, it's not new for anyone to say, oh, we need to interpret a house with music, let's face it. Um, and in fact, one of our houses, Vaucluse House, um, which has been a public museum since 1910, it's the oldest historic house in Australia. Um, we didn't manage it then. But uh, in 1929, they bought a, a, a small square piano thought it was a harpsichord, said it was 500 years old. It was very confused at the time. Um, they sent it off to Parlings to have it restored. Um, so there's actually quite a lot of documentation about them, fixing it up and thinking about what do we do this? We need to, well, what we'd say now, activate the house with music. And so they thought, we need to play gavots. So they played gavots on this um, 1826 Litchfield Binks. It's a really fantastic, rare piano. It doesn't work at the moment, but it's a very interesting piano. Um, so in 1929, they're trying to do that, you know. Um, they're employing lecturers who would play, um, you know, late 19th century music, but trying to be authentic in some way. We don't quite know what they're doing, but... Um, so it's not new. And then the people would... The local sort of pioneers would dance to the gavots in the house. So they're doing something, you know, interesting with the, the property and the, the space. Um, I think we're doing something different, I hope. Um, so we come back to our, our collections. Um, Graham, in his report, identified a really significant album of music, um, Owner Bound Volume, which we, call, which we end up calling the Dowling Songbook. It came from uh, Rouse Hill Estate. It was valued at $32. Um, it consisted of, I don't know how many, oh, 44 pieces. 43 pieces were bound into it, with a singing treatise bound at the back. Um, it was clearly very early. Graham said this is of national significance. We didn't know who, who'd owned it. There was no, we couldn't sort of work out at the, at the time who owned it. Um, but what was really significant about that piece, that, that volume, was that there were printed pieces of music. They were, they'd clearly been, most of them had been acquired in Sydney in the 1830s. They had Sydney music stamps, some of the earliest um, retailers at the time. Um, there was manuscript there as well, so the young woman that we found later is, is really writing out pieces from pre-1833, it's probably 1830 to 33. Um, 
and seven of those songs were quite heavily ornamented. That was really interesting, and very heavily ornamented. Um, and then the singing treatise at the end, um, we haven't found another copy of it. It's British, uh, it's, it's published in London. It's not wildly interesting or different to, to what else was being published at the time, but it's the only known copy and bought in Sydney. So we had all these tools for something really interesting, we thought. And so then we got Neil on board um, and said, right, what are we doing with this, you know? And so the Dowling songbook became the Dowling Project. And um, you might like to talk a bit more about your perspective from the con. So we were happy we had the volume, um, we had uh, the house, but we'll get to that. Um, but then Neil sort of thought, well, what can I do with our students and this, this volume? So, uh, yes, when, when Matthew showed me the book and I saw the markings in the music, it really struck a chord because, of course, that's what I've been doing. Sorry for the pun. Um, looking at uh, artefacts, you know, looking at what performers have written into their scores and things like that and trying to reimagine how that music might have sounded. And of course, we've been working with the early music ensemble here for many years, since, since 2005, and looking for projects to do. And mainly, we've been doing canonic works from the Baroque period and, and the early classical period on period instruments. And more and more, as time has passed, we've been thinking about the sort of practices that, that performers in, in that era used and, and trying to go beyond what we have norm, normally heard in, even in, in our, you know, the best HIP recordings, historically informed performance recordings. So this artifact was very interesting for us and we just had a chat about it and said, let's do a project, which could involve our conservatorium undergraduate and postgraduate students as far as possible. And that's how it all came together. Uh, we, made it one of, uh, we made it one of our early music ensemble projects. Everyone had to be involved in it um, who, who was studying here. And it involved, uh, well, working out what songs we, we, we could put together. We, the, the idea was we were going to perform it in the kind of environment that these songs would, would have been sung in originally. And the best one for that was Elizabeth Bay House and in the parlor, I believe, um, in, the in the drawing room. And We'd never done this with the students, of course, they're just used to putting on concerts in this hall or in Verbruggen Hall, which are completely different, really, in atmosphere and even in acoustic to the sorts of places that music was performed in. Uh, but the, the, the most important pedagogical tool was that we could give the students copies. In fact, we, Matthew organised a tour of, of, of the Caroline Simpson Library for the students, that was the starting point, showed the original uh, the book, and they were able to sort of leave through and, and, and look at the markings and that started this kind of process of imagination um, about of what this might have sounded like. And actually the markings were um, completely stunning, not just ornamentation where words, <coughs> words like rose or round would have these incredibly um, difficult ornaments written around them, things that, that even a professional singer now would find difficult to do, so let alone students, but also they had breath marks. We think they're breath marks. We had lines showing portamento, um, and I can't think about any other things, but those were, those were the main, yeah, appoggiaturas, trill signs, um, little ornament, essential ornament signs and things like that. So really fascinating. We'd, and, and of course, for us, we'd never explored music making in New South Wales and Sydney of that period. It's always been, oh, what happened in Handel at this time in London or, you know, Mozart in Vienna, that sort of thing. So we thought this could be a rich experience for our students. Um, I will say that there was a great narrative around this album, which I think really helps when we think of, we didn't really, well, we did talk about the, we talked about where the book had come from, and I'll just very quickly say it, it was, didn't belong to the Rouse family at all, where we found the book, and we couldn't work out quite why it was there, and it belonged to a, a, a couple, so it's actually quite unusual, and it's male and female collection of music, sort of half and half, basically. Um, and it was the daughter of, the, of John Dowling, who was the first industrialist, basically, in Australia. He brought the first steam engines to Australia in, in um, 1810. Um, incredibly wealthy. And so this was the daughter, and she was putting this collection together in the 1830s. Um, she had a really colourful life in that when she was about 15, she ran off with um, a con man called John Dow, who was pretending to be Viscount Lascelles. He was a convict who was pretending that he'd come to sort of assess the convict system in New South Wales. And um, she ran off with him to Parramatta for a couple of days. And, uh, and then she, having had a chair thrown at her by her father, I think, and she ran off with him, she got dragged back. Um, 
And the father then, who was incredibly wealthy, uh, got into to, um, legal problems um, for fraud and had to leave the country very quickly and left his seven children in Australia. Um, and then the um, John Dow then took Lilius to court saying they'd consummated, they'd got married, they'd consummated the marriage, he was entitled to all her money. And this was before Justice Dowling, who was a, 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 the, the, a judge in Sydney. And he's, we've got his notes still, and he said, oh, she's a girl of a light reputation, but no, it's not true, she, nothing happened, she's fine. Um, oh, and Dad's an atheist, it's just awful. Um, but uh, she, she then married the, the judge's uh, nephew, who was only 21 and she was 17, to his horror. And so it was sort of this incredibly complicated sort of... Um, pretty scandalous couple, and this is their music. And, um, and then Willoughby was an alcoholic, and it was just a very complicated life that they had, and he committed suicide when he was 37. So it's sort of got tragedy, it's got romance, it's got everything in it, um, which we did share with the students. Um, but it wasn't actually part of the big narrative of the, the program, which I think in, if we did it another time now, you might have had more, we've learnt more about the couple, and even the songs that are there and how that might reflect on their, their sort of emotional states often be quite fun. But we'll see that the students actually did engage with the story and they felt that they, yeah, knew Lilius a bit and um, it became quite personal. So we, we made a film. Um, I was going to say, we really immersed the students. The students were coming every week on Friday for three months to the house. So we had the drawing room set up especially for them and you bought a piano. Yeah, well, I should say, just say a little bit about, of course, one of the things that was really necessary to have was, was the sounding source for the accompaniments of these songs and also for any chamber music and solos and things like that. And we didn't have one at the conservatorium, although we do have a collection. And luckily at that point, uh, someone we know in Perth said, said to me, he's a piano tuner and uh, maintenance person, said, oh, my old piano teacher has an 1830s English square piano and she's had it there forever, it's in its original state, nothing's changed on it, and she wants to sell it. And it was just so well-timed, and so through an internal grant here from this, the conservatorium, we managed to purchase that instrument, so we have that here, and we moved it from here to Elizabeth Bay House because there's no working piano there at the moment. Um, and so that's, that, was, that was part of the whole project, and it's a very important part of the song. Yeah, do you hear the students talk a bit about the piano? Um, and so we had the drawing room set up for three months, so which is quite an imposition on the museum. I can tell you I had to really try and convince that, that we could do that. I don't think we could do that now, actually. But um, it was something that really worked well. And so we had it set up a bit like a lecture room. We had, chair, we had Regency chairs there, and so the students would just sort of move in. And they were honestly talking about home quite a lot after a few weeks, weren't they? they oh, I feel like I'm coming home. You know, it's this massive pile, it's sort of, well, in our terms. Um, yeah. So um, I think we should play the video of the yeah, students. I think, I think we'll just play it's five minutes of the students we'll talking a bit about. Uh, yes. Content. I'll just wait for you. There's Abu Editing. Uh, say, That's it. There yeah. you go. It right, I'm going to quickly just also. It's beautiful. It really helps when, when studying, studying music. music. Again, again study it in, in, in a practice, practice room, room on the piano. piano and oh, gosh. Oh, gosh. Some of these Some ornaments are real, real. I just don't, don't think it's, it's, it's a found, found kind of, kind of strange. strange. And then when you, then when you step, step into, into the drawing, the drawing room, room and you, and you see, see even just even the just nature, nature of the, the um, um, ornaments, ornaments on the cabinet, cabinet and all the frames, frames, frames and paintings, and suddenly, and suddenly the, the sound, sound world, world of Lilius Lilius has, has written in, added to music, makes so much more sense. 
down to the point of view. really interesting, interesting one, one from my perspective, but I don't come from a musical background. background. But, I but I do understand the importance that the music, the music played, played in my life in the 19th century. century. For instance, for instance, in our, instance, in our drawing, we have, we have a piano, a piano to suggest, to suggest that the music is a very important element of the way that we all did interact. It definitely, it definitely makes, makes for a much more homely atmosphere if you come home, home and you pull out your, your, your my case 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 down like 10 cents and have a bash, bash through. through. We could very, very, very easily imagine a similar, similar thing happening. happening. Uh, they come, come home, home and they sit around the piano and they play his music, music, music book, book. It makes for, for a much, much more homely atmosphere, if they say. A lot of, a lot of my family is quite musical, so we'll have a gig like my... Uncle, he plays violin, and my auntie, she plays guitar, and viola, and everything. So we'll just, so we'll just have a strum and stuff, stuff in the language, which is sort of a little, a little bit similar to what we're doing there. For me, it's, I mean, it's really, really exciting, exciting to have a to project, project like this take place, place in a home, home like a house. house. So how, how do students come in and play instruments from the period? period. Playing, playing music, music that we that know, we know was played, played in, in Sydney at that time, time. essentially in an interior, very, very, very similar to Dowling's Dowling's interior. interior. It, it adds, adds this one element that is so, so difficult, difficult to, to, to recreate. Playing, playing in Elizabeth Bay House, House has been probably, probably one, one of my favourite musical uh, endeavours, endeavours in my first year. year, year, year. Um, it's been, it's been quite, quite amazing, amazing to be exploring, exploring just changing, changing music in a, in a period, period change chamber setting. setting. Something, something that we don't, don't have, have in Australia. Australia. Okay. 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 Playing, playing the chamber, chamber music of J.S. Park, Park. I can't, I can't go to go Zimmerman's, Zimmerman's coffee, coffee House and play it, play it there, there, but I can play, play you know, these 1830s flutes and other days and 1830s Australian house. It just makes them really, really come alive, especially the piano that we're using. I can't find a better way of doing it. Proper, proper historical and formal forms. Form. And, and I think, I think it, it creates, creates a different, different acoustic world, world to what, to what we, we as modern, modern listeners, listeners are expecting. expecting. In a way, you push the audience to go, okay, you really have to use your imaginations too, because we're recreating as opposed to creating music that's going to entertain you as a modern listener. We're trying to bring you with us on an imagination Tour. You know, it is always a little bit challenging, I think, for everyone to really imagine what it would be like to live in these homes. We come in and we know that the families lived here, we know they did certain things, but to really imagine those things happening, because, you know, the, the past is really quite foreign to us now, but when you have the music performed, when you are sitting in this room, you can really immerse yourself in that kind of lifestyle, it creates a much fuller experience and a much more believable experience. Um, based on a, a research actually um, around Rocks and Kirkland, which I'm persuaded previously does work on the libraries of Scottish collections. And so a lot of the music in this collection is from, from our properties and immigrants who have come to Australia, 1830s and 40s, I think. And also South Africa has a wonderful um, Scottish collection of a family from Vidgar. Um, and so this is just a very short example of um, oh, is it a work? And let me have a word for the change to that. <laughs> About place, but um, we did a, a concert in the in the house, and then it's been recorded and shown, organised, and fantastic. <laughs>
that was funded or part funded anyway by um, one of these UCID collaboration funds with the University of Glasgow, which allowed um, all of those players to come over and also for us to do concerts. Um, so I was just trying to think about a couple of words that might be, um, I guess, meaningful about uh, this snippet. So one of the things that uh, I guess um, I found um, important about this project was uh, in a lot of Australian history, we often talk about the British influence in Australia and sometimes it camouflages many other cultures which are contained within the word British, um, Scottish being one of them. And even within the word Scottish, you have a whole heap of subcultures uh, you can go in and dissect. You had, as part of this project, uh, a song sung in, in um, Scots Gaelic. And um, so that uh, was, yeah, a really interesting sort of um, multi-layered uh, component about this project. The other thing was that um, when you come in and inhabit a space like uh, Elizabeth's Bay House, like I'd never been in that house before. Uh, you always just feel as if you're sort of, it's just the tip of the iceberg when it comes to actually knowing the space. And one of the things for me about bringing historic music to historical um, houses in Australia or other spaces is that you actually need to take time. Um, it's a little bit like the practice of music. You actually have to go back again and again to actually start to become familiar with the space and allow the house to actually become a part of the project. It does sort of um, immediately impose itself on acoustics or you know, the choice of piano or many other things, but for the house to actually be present or for the, the land and the space itself, it's that time thing. You have to take the time. <laughs> so yeah, hopefully that was the first of uh, many, yeah. It's a Scottish house, it's Alexander Maclay's house, so it was a very, very Scottish house and they did play bagpipes and they would have understood Gaelic and um, even though they were quite sort of upper, upper class, um, yeah, it would have been, felt very real to them to hear that Scottish concert, I think, they'd been there. So, um, yes. <coughs> um, some of the, the music that we have, um, we know was connected originally to a specific family or house or place. But uh, that place or the house has been demolished a long time ago and it, or, or else it's irretrievably altered by later changes. And it's a case of what you might have of real music being attached to ghost houses. And to illustrate this, I just want to quickly introduce you briefly to three of the earliest surviving pieces of settler-composed art music connected with Sydney, dating from the 1820s and 1830s. Here is the very earliest composition that survives in a manuscript. It was composed early in 1833 by a man who called himself William Joseph Cavendish, a London professional musician originally, who had just arrived in the colony after spending a few years in Mauritius. It's a set of ballroom dancers scored here for piano solo, a standard set of five quadrilles with two waltzes added. And you'll notice that he's given two of the quadrilles local indigenous titles. At the top, Curry Jong, and down towards the bottom, Wulu Mulu. Um, they survived because he sent the manuscript with a covering letter back to his wife in London. And the family kept them, and finally a descendant donated them to the State Library about 10 years ago. The covering letter is dated Parramatta, April 1833. And though we have no idea of the house he was staying in at the time, we do know that he described the place as a sort of paradise, compared anyway with the sort of poor districts of London that his family lived in, where there were ample supplies, he said, of oranges, grapes, figs, apples, pears, flowers, and fruits all year round. The pigs feed on peaches and the dogs on rump steaks. It's a land of plenty where no one needs to starve or beg. So that was Parramatta as he saw it in 1833. And so here just a very short example of Curry Jong. Thank you.
as in the next slide. No? Okay, so the second example is the very earliest surviving settler composition of all in any media. It survives in a single copy of an edition printed in London around 1830, where it is credited to have been composed by a lady at Sydney. A little bit of searching allows us to identify that lady as Mrs Tempest Margaret Paul, wife of one of Sydney's richer merchants, who appears to have composed it in or around 1826. She called it currency lasses. That's a term for a settler girl children who were born in the colony rather than in Britain. Mrs. Paul had a particular currency lass in mind, her granddaughter, recently born in Sydney. In mid-1826, the Pauls moved into a new house um, in a newly built row of terraces built by the property developer, Sir John Jamison, on the corner of George and what is now Jamison Streets in the city. <coughs> and they threw a housewarming party that was also a christening party and ball for their granddaughter, the currency lass. Next slide. Oh, sorry, one back, back one, yep. And the row and the house have long since been demolished, but we do have an image of what it looked like from a book of Sydney street scenes published in the 1840s. And next slide. And finally, another set of dance music, this time dating from 1835, published in Sydney by the Irish-born music seller Francis <coughs> Ellard, a set of Australian quadrilles dedicated to Miss Mary Healy of Enghurst. Enghurst was a recently completed mansion in what is now Paddington, and parts of the house do still survive today, though so much altered that they're unrecognisable and not accessible to the public. However, we do have an image of what the house looked like from the artist's, sorry, the, from the architect's original drawings for the building. So just to remind us of the house that we've lost, but the music that survives. Great, and I think that's kind of the end of the Dowling and, and the, the projects that we've been doing in EBH, just to give you a bit of a sense of it. That last uh, little excerpt we heard was from a concert that we did in February mm -hmm. this year. Uh, which was one of the sort of outputs of the, the discovery project. But I'm going to now go on, pass you on to, to Jackie. Right. For the for, for really wonderfully important part of our project. Uh, well, I was, uh, first of all, I'd like to acknowledge the Gadigal mob, the clan on whose country we're meeting. Um, in their language, um, the language of the Sydney area, which is essentially one language across the whole basin with nuancing depending on what clan area you're in. So each of these houses sit on various clan areas out at Parramatta, of course, the Baramadigal and other clan groups here, the Gadigal. So I think Rose, Elizabeth Bay House would be on Gadigal land, which is surprise, surprise, under dispute at the moment from other clan groups. This is so normal, so Aboriginal, it's all good. Um, so, but they say ni nari nalawangun Maribadiri Gari Nurada. So um Ninari we um Nalawa to sit down Ngun we um Mari is great or and Budiri is beautiful, good. Um Gadi is the name of the Xantaria Glauka, as I learnt yesterday at our Garabarala, which is our corroboree we have each year for Sydney University. Um and um it's the grass tree for those of you who don't um, know it, our, our visitor from the United States. If you see um, a plant that has a very dark trunk and um, these sort of like, it looks like it's got a um, ballerina skirt of like their leaves all around it and then a stalk up the middle. At the moment, at this time of the year, they're in flower. That's the, um, literally the flower, that's the gaddy. So the, the mob here, were the people here, when they, we don't mean gangsters, we mean the community, we say mob, um, uh, uh, are responsible for the increased ceremony to keep that plant going because it's such an important thing. We all have important things we have to do in our country. We've got visitors from the top end, I believe, with us today who, um, uh, many of whom still continue these practices and we're bringing them back into use in our countries down in the southeast. Um, so, and that's, I guess, where I'm heading with this as well. So the, the Gadigal are responsible for this area. 
um, Nura is country and Da is to sit on country, be in country. So, um, so um, for me, when I was listening just then about how these houses have been used, and I was involved for a long time, of course, with the Historic Houses Trust on the Exhibitions Committee, thanks to Joan Kerr, who taught me at Sydney University. So I've studied colonial history and colonial art and architecture. And so this was a bit of a romp through my own life experiences within the academy. And I thought I, I've done archaeological digs around Sydney in historical archaeology with Judy Birmingham. And those houses always, to me, had a, a sense of the place they were on, particularly because a lot of them were decaying or going back to country. We, we talk about country as being our important places. So, and it can be land and water, um, ocean or rivers. Um, so um, I thought these houses and the country that's reabsorbing them or where they've, that's been stopped and we're preserving them um, would be singing along and enjoying the experience as we, as Aboriginal people say, country does when we sing out to country. So we literally use this term in Aboriginal English, uh, sing out, um, sing out to country, call out to country. So when we go into country, and I've always had this um, in myself, um, that I can't really go on to somewhere that's off country for me, someone else's country, without acknowledging that I'm in that place that's not my place, but I'm pleased to be there. Um, so it's something that I've, I, 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 there are things, you know, you grow up with that you don't even think mark you as different to anybody else. I've just always had that. So one of the things through this project is that uh, me and my, my mob, Narugu, I'm Narugu of the Snowy Mountains in southeastern Australia, where the ice mob <laughs> in Australia, we talk about desert mob, salt water, fresh water, and we're the ice mob. There aren't, there isn't much ice in Australia, not like there is in my country. But I heard the other day that we actually get more snow up in the snowy mountains than, than Switzerland does. And it's possibly because it's a bigger area, but that I thought was kind of startling. So uh, we don't quite have the same pists for skiing, but <laughs> we've got a good couple of them. But yeah, snow, it's the snow increase ceremony song, that's, it's working. So um, I've been singing out to my country with my mob. Um, and that's, um, so that's our houses, you know, these are our special places, these are our environments that also give us a particular kind of acoustic. Um, and Neil's been involved in these and so has Graham in these events. And, and Amanda, of course, who's sitting in the audience there and um, uh, a, a main, a key driver in all of this actually. Um, and Linda Barwick and others, you know, um, some of my own PhD students who are also from mountain country, one fellow who's from the Himalayas um, in northwest Pakistan. So, um, but we were all affected and moved, I think, by the experience of singing out to country. Um, and the Narugu Nation Indigenous Corporation, uh, all these corporations we have now as Aboriginal people, but that's a group of um, that works also with Tumbarumba, Tumbarumba um, in the Snowy Mountains to sort of bring us together to be able to do things like cultural things um, and, ha and survive as people. So we started from this, this um, spot of this document, uh, which is, correct me, Graeme, if I'm wrong, the first published piece of music in Australia. Thank you. There you go. I'm, I'm a quick learner. <laughs> well, it's taken me two years to learn that, but I'm a... <laughs> 1834. So this man called John Lotsky, who was very interested in us, um, but also interested in the environment and geology and plants and everything else, um, he went from Sydney down into the mountains and at, he stopped in the mountains at one point and under the... the light of a full moon, he sat with my mob and he heard the women singing this song, a song of the women of the Manaru tribe, as he called it. Manaru or Monero is a familiar term, that district's known as the Monero, right down into the border with Victoria. Um, and he, all, not only did he remember what the sound was like, 
Uh, he may have made some notation when he was on country, but we don't have access to his um, original manuscripts. Maybe one day we'll find them. I'm sure Graham, who can find anything, will. Um, Graham has this in his amazing archive, Austral Harmony. But I actually encountered it first in the 1980s when I was doing my PhD. And I, I sort of, I've always avoided a bit doing things about my own mob because it's very hard working family history, immediate family history and working with your own communities very, it has its complications. And it's also very confronting because it makes me feel like we've lost so much. In fact, through this project and the one with Linda Barwick, I'd, instead of feeling a sense of loss, I feel a great sense of, um, of, of um, having a lot, actually. Um, this, this song didn't do for me what it's doing now when I first encountered it. It was an archival record. It had this funny little epithet with it. Well, not funny. It was all about how we were all disappearing and dying and our children were wasting away and, oh, dear, probably why I put it away. And it, it, Can we just see an example of what, what Lotsky produced? Um, and this is Amanda and Neil performing it at a concert here. Um, sure, but it, maybe before we do that, if I could just say that what he did when he came back to Sydney was he turned it into something that's like what we've been talking about today in a number of presentations, actually not only ours. Um, he turned it into something very European and with all these kind of flourishes and things that... Um, and Linda Barwick, as a musicologist, was able to... and very familiar with Aboriginal music, it's a particular field, was able to clean it of all of that kind of Europeanness. And what remained in the score was um, something that looked very like southeastern Australian corroboree music. Corroboree is our word. Oh, right. Well, I'm, I'm, okay. So uh, they've, they've, this has been orchestrated by two, <laughs> two hexper, hexperts. I'm using Aboriginal English there. So, that, <laughs> so, so maybe I should follow your cueing. And we'll, so in short, it, we, we recovered it as an Aboriginal corroboree song but it, we also explored it as a non-Aboriginal song. Um, well, yeah, and I'm sure that the houses where it was performed would have sung to that tune, but my country sings to the tune of what we're doing, and it does bring the snow. I sang it, the other, I sang it yesterday, instantly cold. I'm waiting for a big dump <laughs> of snow on Sydney University, and I will be skiing down Victoria Park. <laughs> So you, I'm, I'm now going to let you play something. Just, Sorry. Just, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. This is Amanda being fabulous. <laughs> And Amanda felt a bit funny about seeing this, didn't you, Amanda? Because it felt so wrong in a way to you. But in fact, to me, it's... Um, <coughs> I, I kind of love it. It's, it's very beautiful and your voice is lovely. And that gaba, you know, calling out to the moon, gaba, gabara, just it feels like, you know. And in the back um, behind Amanda is an image of the place we, fa we actually recovered exactly where this would have been f performed in 1834. And that's on... Um, oh. So the, the image... It, well, that one behind Amanda, why I like that was because it looks like the picture's sort of vibrating, the country's embracing this song, you know, but that's on, the bend of the, on a bend of the Snowy River at a place um, called, was called Matong near Dalgetty in the Snowy Mountains. So that's Amanda singing in this very European way, but it still resonates for country, I feel. So it preserves it. Please do. Yes, feel free to talk. You would have seen the square piano, the same square piano that we've been using in all of our projects, but also that was a really special 
um, event with the early music ensemble again. So it's kind of drawing all of these things together. And it was also exploring, uh, it was part of the discovery project and exploring music from the 1830s or so for orchestra. But there was something around also that this, you know, if you were in Sydney at that time, you would have heard Aboriginals singing. Mm. Maybe. Around. And, Possibly. And, and yeah. we also wanted to yeah. try to, this is part of the reimagining, try to sort of change the landscape, uh, excuse the pun, of, of, of our music making and to bring that song um, both in the Lotsky format but also yeah. um, a little later in that concert, uh, Jackie led the singing with some of the females from the orchestra and gave them exp an experience of singing the song. So it was, it was incredibly... Yeah. In, uh, new thing for the conservatorium to have that all brought together in, in one of our yeah, you know, pedagogical so, things. So we had this sort of um, anti-colonial intervention, actually, um, and uh, where we... And actually, the audience really responded to the corroboree version. I think people really lo loved that version, but the corroboree one was such an intervention, and... And it was powerful for me too, I have to say. I felt it and I think everyone that sang it. Um, so um, Linda and I, as I said, Linda worked on the music. I worked on the, the language as a linguist. Um, and um, I reconstructed it. Look, it's using creative practice. Um, we, I, we both used our um, techniques of our disciplines, linguistics and musicology. Um, and anthropology, we imagined ourselves into the space and what would be going on at that time of the year. So it's late March, 28th of March, I think, um, the full moon, 1834, um, on country. At that time of the year, the frost is beginning and the moon gets this kind of frosty ring around it. Um, it would probably, be, it I think he said it was a clear night, but to see the moon it would have been. And um, the river sparkles under the moonlight, and it would have been quite a um, an atmospheric event. And the reason why we sing a snow increase ceremony song, which this could well be, um, it's what I've interpreted it as, is because at that time of the year you want to call the snow, and if the snow doesn't happen, all the other things that up in my country should happen don't happen. So without snow, you don't get the melt, you don't have the alpine meadows the rivers downstream, including, we don't have any, very many rivers in Australia, but we have this big river system, the Murray Murrumbidgee, and the water from the Snowy Mountains flows, the melt flows into that. So it's environmentally extremely important, and that wasn't lost on us, of course, as Aboriginal people, as people who have to care for country. You care for country, it cares for you. You care for a house, it cares for you. It makes it a home, right? Um, so that's the kind of thing. It's, this is, these are similar ideas. So I, um, using word lists from the 19th century also, a little bit later than this, I was able to um, pull out that there's this word ku, gu, which is snow. Um, then you've got things to, um, you know, something that turns a word into our languages, uh, we call them polyagglutinative. So you have a stem and you add things onto it. It's a bit like writing music, right? So um, you've got something that turns something into an adjective, and then you've got something that says, do it, an imperative. So, gunji, you know, come on, make the snow. Um, by and by, you know, gawal, gawal, iterative, again and again, by and by, bring it again, bring it again, for us, for us, you know, for, um, yeah. So, and then we, this word, this word, one of the key words I found was this thing. I can, I can yeah, yeah, gaba, um, which is the moon, calling out to the moon. That was a key thing. And then moon, make it snow. Can you do this? Make it snow. Keep making it snow. And then so this kind of calling out and in this chanting sort of style that we, we do in our corroboree songs. This is very typical. It's not meant to be like spoken language. We don't, it's not like telling somebody something so translating it's a little bit complicated but it's basically this idea and it's very powerful you know gunji gawal guyuri gunji gawal guyuri you know it goes on like this you know and gaba gumaji gugu and when i first started to think about how to sing it i sang it with 
Linda at her home and we walked and we chanted as we sang it and there's also evidence of a, of a percussion beat which suggests what, um, you know, women normally when they're singing have like a possum skin that we would drum on down in this country here. So, and that actually gave that rhythm, didn't it, Amanda? So the more we sing it, um, the more it makes sense and the more it, it, it stays with my mob. And it's, the, it's funny because I find when I'm going through country, it comes to my mind a lot. Um, yeah, so I don't know what you've got on your next. Um, so, and this was Lotsky's, it might be good to have a quick look at Lotsky's journey. We, we've written a paper, oh, Linda and I have written a paper about this, Troy and Barwick, so um, it's open access if you want to read in more detail. But um, this is the journey that, um, oh, right, that, that Lotsky um, went on and in figuring out which full moon he would have been able to, where he would have had to have been, gave us a clue about where he would have been when he heard this song. So that's why we're pretty sure it was at this place called Matong. And it's well and truly in the mountains and it's a place where people could camp, be sheltered. Is there anything well, else? Wasn't it that the story? Also, that you and Linda went looking for it, right? Yeah, well, actually, my cousin um, Peter Waples oh, Crow yes. and Linda went looking, and the people who've got the block now, um, they let us in, and then they let us perform, all of us perform this song on country. Did you have the on country performance, maybe? Yeah, no, oh, yeah, there's my cousin, that's Peter. That's my daughter, Lara, and me. And this is the bend in the river. You could just imagine. Uh, my mother actually thinks that we may have done something over where there's a quartz quarry, which is a, a very important rock for us, and these sparkly quartz in the moonlight, you know, so she thought... But certainly that's the spot. We're pretty sure that's it. And you can see the joy. And Lara, my daughter, went back to Sydney with Neil and was just a different person, wasn't she? On the way down, she was diffident about doing this. And here we are singing. But do we have the actual... Yep. You have to press something. Yeah, okay. Shall we listen to this? Yeah, and that's it. <laughs> Had the, in, there was an indication that the men were involved in the performance with the percussion in the way that we've got um, Peter there on the clap boomerangs. Um, and my daughter um, took control of the singing. It was really interesting. She went from this position of being quite, you know, unsure about what we were really up to. And she said when I came home from Linda's and sang the song, she said, I don't like the sound of that. It was all very sort of, I think it was just, um, you know, some fear really, um, and not understanding, uh, but also having a sense that it was, it's a powerful thing in itself. And should we even be doing this? I think she, there is, there's definitely an element of that, but now she's really owned it. And on the way down to the mountain, she said, because I was, there was, we had a fraught trip and she said, mummy, we have to go. This is really important. We need to do this. And then she took, because I was so incompetent with my singing, <laughs> she took control of the music. And that was, I thought, this is wonderful because my mother is handing on to her in the way that grandmothers hand on to granddaughters. Um, and my grandmother died when I was still quite young. 
and she'd begun to hand information on to me and then she died. So my daughter gets it from my mum now and then my mum, she shares what she feels I should know with me. Um, but I'm sort of left out of this circle. But she's, she's building into a, po a person who will be, you know, strong for our country into the future. So this, this, this project has had a very important impact on me personally, my family and my extended community. I think we should go to questions. Yes, we're probably, uh, we're at 20 past. So that, thank you so much. Is there someone in the audience who would like to ask a question of the panel? Or online, is there any hands online? Yeah, wonderful. Okay, you call? Thank you for... Thank you for that. I don't know if this is... Hello, hello, hello. Uh, okay. Um, thank you for that. It was wonderful and insightful from all of you. Um, I did have a question um, about the... Um, you said how complicated it could be, the translation um, uh, because of the context versus just complete sentences. And I was more, I was curious also about um, the uh, inflection, like where, how the music and the text come together, um, you know, with syllables, inflection, rhythm, meter, dare I say. <laughs> well, that's a really good question. Um, so it's complex because really, um, it, with Aboriginal music generally, it, as I said, it's not like spoken language. So quite often we have a separate language even for music. So there'll be, and they, depending on what kind of p context something's being, being sung, um, it will have a different kind of, it'll have, there'll even be different, a whole different, um, well, there's different language for, for different kinds of purposes. Um, I've taken this as being one that is a, public performance, if Lotsky could hear it, then it's probably one that most people would have access to. It was probably sung, at least the basis for it would be our everyday language. But it's not something, like you wouldn't, you wouldn't speak in the way that people were singing here. But, um, so I've, I've translated it fairly literally using the information we've got about our language. I could be completely wrong, but I feel pretty certain because there are so many compelling items in there. But because we have this system where, as I said, we have a stem word and then you add things onto it, who did what, where and when and how and all that um, polyagglutinant, if we call it, um, it's, um, I have to be sure of what those inflections are, what the suffixing is. Um, so again, I've used a bit of creative license, but it is using what would be predictable for my language. The breaks were really important. Uh, how, if you like, the, the syllabization, if you like, or the morpheme boundaries, we call it in linguistics. So the the bit, the units like gu as snow, n as the um, adjective adjectivizer, d you know as the iterative, whatever. Those though. As I analysed it, Linda found it remarkable how it mapped onto the, the, the notation for the music. So it wasn't like I was trying to force something in to match the notation. It's just as I said, OK, I think this is a separate morpheme, a separate meaningful unit here. It mapped actually onto these separate marks to create the musical notation. Um, so it just literally fell into place. And what was fascinating was to see a musician working with a linguist and how our two disciplinary areas brought this thing into um, what, what would be very predictable for a piece of corroboree, as we call it, corroboree music, Aboriginal music. Um, does that at least go part towards answering your question? Yeah. Another question from the audience? Or online? Just, just here. Thank you so much. Uh, I had a, actually a question about the quadrilles and particularly the, 
La Woolloomooloo, and was curious to know whether the Woolloomooloo in the 1833 manuscript was the same as the one in the Australian quadrille, that particular um, figure, or if that's known. Sorry, did you hear that? Oh, sorry. Yeah, just wanted to know if the Woolloomooloo in the Australia quadrille was the same as the one in the 1833 manuscript, because there seemed to be a Woolloomooloo in both of those uh, as a figure. showed the, his quadrilles to Ellard, the, the music seller, hoping that Ellard might print them. And Ellard didn't. But two years later, when Ellard put his own set of quadrilles together, he borrowed the idea of using a couple of indigenous titles. And so there was, a, he borrowed the idea of La Woolamaloo for one of the, the 1835 quadrilles. And the other one was La Bong Bong. So yes. It is the same, but not the same piece of music. So it's the same idea. Yeah. Can, I, can I say something about these natural names? Yeah. Mm. Uh, I was struck by like, the, the choice. So Woolloomooloo, of course, is a place where the, um, an, um, a man-making ceremony was held for, for young men, um, where the tooth avulsion ceremony would happen. So the front tooth was knocked out. Um, just literally where we call what is now called Woolloomooloo. So for our international visitor, you might, when you're walking down that area, that's a very Aboriginal place, um, very important ceremonial place. And that's somewhere where other language would have been used because it's a ceremon ceremonial place. Um, and Woolloomooloo is something to do with blood. Um, so it's interesting that, I, I mean, the, as you said, the... Uh, well, I don't know how much Aboriginal, how many Aboriginal people were singing around Sydney, but certainly the presence. It's only very recently in 18, the 1830s that Australia was invaded by the British, and there were people who had spent their time in the colony, in the um, site of invasion, knowing a lot about Aboriginal people and having a lot to do with them. So things that are now a bit lost in our, you know, colonial past, um, uh, were very understood and apparent. And the use of the local language was much more extensive by local um, non-Aboriginal people. So words like Woolloomooloo would have had a lot of loaded meaning. I mean, that is a really, really loaded word and loaded place. Um, Guringai, you know, guy is a associative suffix and guri, guri people, here it's Eora, but it's something to do with belonging or connected to something, associated with something. Um, so each of these words, I suspect, are chosen very... And that, that fascinates me that they're associated with things like quadrille, which maybe have particular significance as well culturally, like we talked about the cultural significance of particular styles of music to the or people... The for, da, or the <coughs> dance, like some kind of... Yeah, so, yeah, so Woolloomooloo is a place where there would have been a lot of corroboree um, and um, a lot of tension between the sexes, men, no women wanting to know what's going on and not being allowed to and their sons being taken away to be made men. So there's that kind of, um, you know, it's really, I think there's, there's a whole other cultural story associated and with this choice of Aboriginal language, um, not just because they're sort of scenic or what do you call it, evocative, they're evocative but for reasons that we possibly can't see our way into at the moment, but we could with a bit more thinking through how these words were used. Anyway, that's just my thinking about the language. Yes, a uh, question, uh, question from Chris. Okay, I think this is now working. Thanks. Um, uh, I have a question actually about the historic houses. Um, and um, 
and so if I'm wrong about this, then I apologize in advance. My understanding is that the, um, the, the sort of way that Rouse Hill operates as a historic house is a little bit different from the way Elizabeth Bay works, that Elizabeth Bay is sort of a curated space and Rouse Hill is a, a preserved space. Um, and I was wondering if, you know, is that by design or is that a matter of how the houses were requested and is that meant to teach us different things or teach us to imagine in different ways? And if you could talk a little bit about that. Yes, so Elizabeth Bay House um, has virtually nothing in it that is provenance to the family. And in fact, it's had, in the 1970s, it was going to be the Lord Mayor of Sydney's house. So it had a very, very opulent uh, interior, incredible curtains. Uh, Historic Houses Trust took over and removed those very controversially. And in fact, I worked for the Carolyn Simpson Library and Carolyn Simpson, Library had paid for, uh, Carolyn Simpson had paid for the curtains in the 70s, vast amounts of money. And so there was, wouldn't happen now, but the newspapers were full of the scandal of moving the curtains. And we took it back to based more on the idea that the family had gone bankrupt while they were in the house. It was going to be a lot simpler than the one that we were seeing. So, so it's a complete construction. Um, I mean, you know, you've got paint finishes that are based on paint scrapes and... Um, the library is actually provenance to the family. Some of the books there are, I think there's one other object. So I sort of see that place as a representative space. So, so it does give you a lot of freedom. It's quite robust too, so we can do concerts there um, and can impose maybe. So we've done oh, um, a, a Swedish concert about science. So Solander came here in 1770 with Captain Cook. So that was the first Swede that had visited. And so there was a whole concert about with Swedish music. Um, and Alexander Maclay was a, a member of the Swedish Academy, and so there were these connections. And so you, it's quite broad. You, I, I sort of see it as a place that you can, yeah, be more creative in terms of, of, of exploring music and themes. Rouse Hill is um, incredibly fragile. Um, you can't perform a concert in there. We have done, um, digitally we're doing stuff. So we've got Sydney Children's Choir did a work um, that was composed, uh, based on one of the songs that they found there. And so then we filmed that, and so that's online. So that's one way of doing it, I think. And then we've done stuff in the, 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 the farm around the house, musically, but there won't be concerts in that house. It's too, too fat. Yes, it's an example of um, a, 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 probably a British way of interpreting these houses where there's incredible patina and they're sort of falling down. They look like they're falling down. They're not. But they are structurally very hard to, to manage because they are falling apart. Um, so we've got different sorts of properties, and so we can use them in different ways. And, I, and someone like, somewhere like Vaucluse House is a, I see it as a community place. It's been in the community's ownership for, well, for a very long time. Um, and so they often have carols by candlelight they've had there. Um, generations of families have gone there to look at the wisteria. Um, so I see that as sort of owned by lots of people. It's not really a, you know, it's a different way of thinking. So I think it gives you the scope to actually explore lots of different types of music and lots of different context within the, the houses. And just the, the idea that, is the idea that there can be no intervention in Rouse Hill House, that it will just eventually disintegrate, or no, can there it, be intervention? There is intervention, okay. yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, ongoing discussion. And I think there's one more question here, and that might yep. be the last one for the session. Um, thank you for sharing about the projects. It's really um, beautiful to hear the singing and all of the... I've, I've been semi-involved in some of the early stuff there. But um, it really strikes me that the material that's surviving in the historic houses in Sydney, um, you know, that it's coming from people who essentially moved to Australia of their own free will, you know, in the 19th century. And I'm wondering, um, you know, what is it in the archive that you have or is there anything that... Um, you know, is, is um, to do with like what Jackie was mentioning earlier about the people who were sort of swept up in the colonial project, um, you know, folk music. Um, my parents have a Australian folk music book, which is full of music of, um, uh, you know, oh, I had to leave Dublin, um, I left my love behind, you know, so they weren't, they weren't willingly coming here and, and what's in the kind of is there anything in, in your archives that you've found like that material? Oh, there is, um, well, folk, Scottish folk music. We've, we've got, but it's, yeah, it's late 18th century. It's been brought here um, probably in the 1850s, I think. Um, 
but not, no, it, look, a lot of it's parlour music, let's face it. <laughs> um, that is the, the, having said that, there is music that belonged, the more we look at the provenance of the collection, so you get an album from somebody, um, we've got four, four volumes now that belong to um, the Daughters of Convicts, so that's something we've never really thought about before, so it's all very similar music, but what are the aspirations of those women? Um, so that's another way of thinking about who owned this and who they were and what are they doing. Um, but no, not a lot of folk music. I mean, Graham will sort of know more about folk music, but um, it tends to be parlour. Parlour music, basically, yeah. Um, when I was doing my PhD, which is a very long time ago now, but um, I came across, and it may be that, like, the books that I used to... I, did, I looked at language contact between 1788 and 1920, and, of course, that was anything, including musical material. But the... Um, the books that I used were the kinds of things that colonial libraries would have had. So people who were literate and building their libraries had these. A lot of them were handbooks and things. And I, there's one book, it may be Godfrey Arabin, or the, there were a lot of these sort of penny dreadful type ripping yarns, you know, that were popular in the 19th century. But there's one fragment of a song, and I've referenced it in my PhD, we've talked about this before, and it goes, it's not, it doesn't have a score, but it's the text, and it's the only thing I ever found. I got very interested in the influence of Irish people on the development of pidgin language in New South Wales, because they were the main language group. It wasn't actually people from England. There were never very many people from actually from England. It was mostly these, in the early period, Irish convicts or Irish people. So, um, this song is a mixture, we've talked about it too, Laura, of, of Wiradjuri and Irish is what it looks like to me and looks like to Irish-speaking people that I know, including my husband. And it's Kanamga River Me Mora, Mora Hola de Buriman, Mora Hola de Buriman, Kanamga River Me Mora, Mora Hola de Buriman. So it's Kanamga River Me, come here, River Me Mora, hand. So that's the Aboriginal word. Come here, give me your hand, Morahola, because of the Buriman. Buriman is Aboriginal English. Policeman, Buriman. Come and give me your hand because of the policeman. So again, back to these songs are not full descriptions as you might have in speaking, not speaking, you know, conversing. Give me your hand, let's, you know, so run away. The policeman's coming. Look out, policeman coming, Buriman coming. And so, um, and it, it was a corroboree song. It's written in the book as a corroboree song, but with no, no score. But, you know, so there is this... There, are, there may be other fragments like this where Aboriginal people... And that's that immediate moment where some, someone who's Irish-speaking, maybe an Aboriginal person who spoke Irish, because people would have, um, and, a, you know, mixed Wiradjuri with an Aboriginal English, you know, pigeon, New South Wales pigeon, with, to create this song, which I think is a very rare thing to have survived. Um, and so there may be that kind of, you can almost feel the moment, you know, so. Okay, well, please um, join me in thanking the panel.